Welcome to this webinar. My name is Claire Ladd. I'm the Programs and Services Manager at Massachusetts Nonprofit Network, or MNN. Thank you all for joining us today. And just a few housekeeping items before we get into the actual webinar content. The, um, today's webinar is recorded. We'll send the recording out along with the slides after the webinar, so just keep an eye out for that. And you feel free to use the chat function anytime. Let us know if you have any technical difficulties or any issues. You can submit questions via the chat or the Q&A function at any time as well. So there will be time at the end to answer any questions. I also just want to give a little bit of background about us at MNN. Our goals are to strengthen the nonprofit sector through advocacy, public awareness, and capacity building. Our webinar series is part of our capacity building offerings. We offer regular webinars, so please stay tuned for any future topics and just let us know if there's any topics that you're interested in seeing in the future. And our efforts are made possible by more than 600 member organizations. So thank you for all of our members. And if you have not yet joined, you can go to our website under membership to find out more about all the advantages of being a member, including cost savings, networking opportunities, trainings, et cetera. All right, so today's webinar on tools and automation for HR will be presented by Russell Greenwald and Scott Haggerty of InSource Services. And I will hand it over to them to tell you a little bit more about InSource and then get started with the webinar. Cool, thank you, Claire. Um, as the presentation goes, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in chat. We'll either address them uh, while we're on the slide or we'll leave time in the end for any more questions that come up in chat that we'll answer. Uh, to start off, my name is Russell Greenwald. I'm the Vice President here at InSource Services. I started the IT practice here about 22 years ago. Uh, InSource is a IT, HR, and finance uh, consulting organization. We're in our 30th year of business. We're based in the greater New England, Boston area that we now have staff um, in 28 states, uh, coast to coast and north to south. Uh, we service uh, nonprofits for the last 30 years. It's still a huge part of what we operate. Uh, we're very grateful to have nonprofits, um, and we're very grateful to be partnering with MNN for things like this. Also joining me today is Scott Haggerty, um, an IT director who's been with us over 10 years. Um, Scott is running our uh, a lot of our data solutions work um, that goes into what we're we're showing off today. So we're very excited um, to dive into the material. Uh, as we get started, one thing to note, and we can go over it, uh, this last year, InSource started doing um, InSource started doing UKG Ready, which is an, a human resource information system. So we are now UKG Ready partner implementation. We still obviously work with other products that we'll showcase, including ADP. Um, and we also start our data solutions practice, which does data visualization, <laughs> integration, and Power App development um, for organizations, many of which we'll answer today. So what are we doing today? Uh, we wanted to showcase to everyone attending uh, how automation um, and the tools from Microsoft can benefit HR platforms or HR departments. We wanna go over what is the Microsoft platform, why specifically are we addressing that tool uh, for nonprofits and HR departments, and just go over how business processes and automation can be a benefit overall. We'll start with a bit of what is automation and going over that. We'll go over the Power Platform, Microsoft specifically. We'll dive into some examples during that. We're going to go over an employee journey of how we experience it from a uh, business process standpoint, and then we'll do some demo of artificial intelligence, some automations, and other really fun tools that are uh, very new, right? A lot of this stuff is as of like the last year, um, but the speed of which it's growing and how it's being adopted is faster than most things historically. So to start, um, you can you can use chat. I'm curious. Um, how many people here are using automation right now? And or how many people here want to use automation? I see some of that already. And last, 
uh, do you already have an identified need and you're looking for ways to solve it using automation? All things we hope to address um, with some of our answers today. Excellent. Some of the answers are actually quite helpful um, for us to address and go over how, how it can be adopted, um, where, where it's used best, and what to think about. When you think about automation, especially in the HR department, I think about if I'm doing something repetitive and it's administrative, can I automate it and make it go away? So if I'm spending a half an hour a day doing something, can I not do it anymore with an automation? And automation and improving processes can be enterprise scale efficiency, or they can just make your life better. So I think if you're a small org or you're a large org, these, these processes and tools can still benefit you. Um, and the Microsoft tool set is very accessible to even very small organizations to benefit even a little bit of what you're doing. And this is an example I wanted to showcase because I think this is a great example of I'm a small organization, but a task takes up a lot of my time and I make it go away with an automation. Microsoft, um, which offers a lot of their products heavily discounted or free to nonprofits, <coughs> has a tool called Power Automate. Power Automate allows you to take something that you would do manually and put it into what it calls a flow, hence the diagram on this screenshot. And it's using tools that are accessible to you without programming, without knowing code, uh, with, without a lot of technology background, the ability to take a process you do through a lot of clicks, make it an automation is very accessible to the less, uh, to, you don't have to be in the IT department to be able to make that happen. So in this example of Power Automate, uh, which by the way, and I don't wanna get overboard, this automation, I didn't even create it. Uh, Microsoft now has AI as a part of uh, Power Automate where I could say artificial intelligence, create me an automation that every time a form is filled out, I wanna offer a letter to go to the candidate on the form. I want it to go through an approval process and then I want it to go out as, a, as an offer letter uh, to the candidate. So I asked AI to, in natural language to create an automation for me and it built this for me. <laughs> so it's gotten to a point where I don't even have to go through building it. I can just ask AI to build it based on my request. What this automation does, you could have a form, an internal form where uh, maybe a recruiter or someone else fills it out saying, I wanna make an offer to Scott Haggerty uh, for an IT director position and other data on the form. Then the form would be submitted and you would get prompted in your email to approve the data on the form. Once you approve it, then the form would fill out a templated Word document that's the offer letter with the data from it and it would email it to the candidate. And all that had to happen was filling out a form and hitting approve and what could have been half an hour to an hour a day, depending on how, like what your level of recruiting is down to like a minute or less. And we'll get into a little bit later, even how AI um, can make that happen, can help you with that process as well. <laughs> so I wanted to speak about a different type of automation. And firstly, I'm gonna ask, I know we have a lot of HR people attending today. How many of you have had to work with IT or even have had to sometimes deal with a misunderstanding or a miscommunication? where maybe there's a misspelling or IT doesn't know about a recent update. Perhaps somebody's name changed and they notified HR, but they didn't notify IT, or maybe they notify HR and then HR has to notify IT. Is that a common scenario? Has anyone here uh, experienced something like that? Yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you can raise your hand, but virtual hand, sure. Um, yeah, so 
that's definitely an experience that we've seen. Uh, we've recognized, especially for new staff, that can be a really kind of dissatisfying or almost demoralizing experience where you're really excited to start your new position, you're joining the company, you're joining the organization, and then something just isn't right on day one or week one. And it's it's something that really uh, doesn't doesn't present the best the best face of the organization. Um, so to address that challenge, what we do here is we actually tie two systems together. Um, the idea being that when an account comes into existence, when a, a person, when a user comes into existence in the HR system, information about that person will flow into the IT system without a human having to get involved, having to fill out an additional form, having to draft an additional email, having to either make the hiring manager request two changes twice or reducing the load on HR staff of saying, okay, it gets processed once through HR and then that is the source of truth. That is the information that gets disseminated out to the rest of the organization, specifically the IT department. So I won't get into the nuts and bolts in too much detail, uh, but I will mention that the way we accomplish this is by using an interface um, an API for anyone who's familiar with that, an application programming interface, uh, but using an API that many HR systems have and pulling the data out of there, <laughs> then using a small app that can exist in the Microsoft environment or in other environments uh, that takes that information, looks at the IT environment, the IT directory, matches and says, oh, this person already exists, time to make an update, or determines that there is, that person does not exist yet, and then they will go ahead and just create the new account. So it saves uh, time both for that manual communication, the manual setup, but most importantly, I believe it keeps the systems aligned so that there is only one version of a person in how they're represented throughout the organization systems. And we never want IT to be a reason employee is unhappy from either a computer that doesn't work um, other things, but we know that how they show up in the system is incredibly important. Having their name spelled properly um, is really important to staff. It's a very personal thing. Having the title that reflects their current job or their current manager, uh, if it's not right, that could create a lot of issues internally because they'll they could think that was against them. So these kind of syncs allow IT systems to be like to be 100% accurate with what's in the HR systems. So when employee is promoted, manager changes, the name changes, it's always in sync. And also, especially with new staff, a lot of work, if the name is spelled wrong, it's a lot of work to fix it. So this prevents that from happening in the first place. How many people here, and I'd be curious if you can put it in chat, are using AI right now in your roles? If you're not using AI yet, and it's a whole nother topic, like maybe I can give the simplest form. Uh, obviously the most popular is chat GPT and Google has their own and Microsoft has one that they have an enterprise version that's more secure. Obviously don't put anything sensitive in chat GPT. It's not meant for sensitive data. Uh, it's good to start experimenting with it. We don't suggest as you start to use AI as sources of truth for anything, but it is a really nice mechanism to get something started, to get a draft started. In this example, if you're looking to create an offer letter and you maybe want to improve your upon your template or you don't have one to start, you can simply ask a chat GPT to create an offer letter. And then you can ask it to tweak it, create it for someone in Massachusetts, create it for this job description, and it can keep refining it. So we, we love the use of AI for drafts to get something started. So in an HR, it'd be a great use for drafting an offer letter. It could be a great use for drafting a bio for new staff. So if you have a lot of new staff and you're trying to write creative bios for them, and I we write our bios for our staff and it's always hard to be creative again and again, these tools allow you to put in bullets about who the staff is, previous jobs, other things, and it'll create a unique bio you can edit to put in your own words, but gets you started and saves you time. And then obviously you can draft templated emails and create some of those templates you may want to put in automation for offer letters or other things that we spoke about earlier.
as you use AI to do these things, the one thing you can really tweak um, for, if you don't use it a lot, you say, write me a bio, make it no more than 500 words. Now make it more professional, make it sound fun, make it sound motivating. So as you're using it, you can keep tweaking, asking it to tweak it based on certain factors and it will. You can even have it put it in the voice of someone. Write an offer letter in the voice of William Shatner and it actually will. Um, you, you can even sometimes say, write it in the voice of my own if you give an example. So it's very powerful and it can save you a lot of time with creating material. I wanna briefly uh, talk about the Power Platform broadly. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of these more specifically here in just a moment. Russell mentioned earlier that Power Automate flow he was showing earlier. Uh, that's a very common place where people kind of start their engagement with the Power Platform. We'll talk about Power BI, which is data analytics and Power Apps, which is small custom software. But we wanted to also mention Power Pages, a more modern version of websites, and Power Virtual Agents, which are uh, somewhat anal analogous to chatbots. Uh, so I want to dig in on the next slide to Power BI a little bit. Uh, Power BI, I think of as uh, like an Excel pivot table on steroids <laughs> to a degree. It's, uh, it's data analytics, it's numbers, it's visuals. One of the key differences, and we'll show this in the demo, is that it's interactive that instead of having to present data and then someone says, oh, what about, and they ask a question and having to then re-present that data, the data can be presented in a report and a person, when they interact with it, can answer some of those questions on their own. And the data, the visuals, the graphs, the charts, the tables, they will actually update in response to what the person consuming the report is clicking on. So that interactive part is really important and a, a big difference between those who maybe, especially if they see an Excel spreadsheet or they see a pivot table, it, it might be a bit overwhelming. You can see in the example here, it, it will summarize some data. And this is talking about some hiring data, uh, you know, gender, or, uh, ethnicity, and basically just breaking down, okay, what, what does our data look like? What is the narrative that it tells? And Power BI can get its data source from Excel, from a database, from many other things to give you the visual to interact with. Yeah, that's so this is a bit under the hood that it can pull from files that are on your computer. It can pull from cloud databases. It can pull from all sorts of different places and put that data into one view to be consumed, um, which is a really powerful way to create some relationships and then draw out those narratives. The other thing that's really helpful is that that data, when it's pulled from various sources, you can have it refresh automatically. So we actually do that at InSource. Uh, we set up the reports and then overnight, the data just updates without any person having to go in, log in, download a spreadsheet, upload a spreadsheet, maybe make some changes in the spreadsheet before they upload it. All of that process goes away because we built the report, we built the queries in a way that automates that process. So now whenever the uh, the report consumer wants to see the data, they open up a website, it has data that has been updated, I mentioned overnight, but it could be even more frequent than that. But it's updated so that it is current all the time and does not require anyone to exert effort on an ongoing basis to keep it up to date. Uh, and one little note I will say, if you go back, Russ, just very quick. Uh, when I mentioned those report consumers, a feature that is really powerful is that you can also change who sees what. And so a use case we're working on and have done a bit already is that people can see information about the staff that they manage, not necessarily about the staff they don't manage. So managers can see the staff who report to them, whatever information you're trying to display. Executives might be able to see everybody in the organization or maybe only those who report to people who report to them and so forth. Um, but that is a really important difference between in Excel, it's really hard if you're giving data, you're usually giving all the data. In Power BI, you can give a portion of the data, all of the data, there's a lot of granularity available.
Power Apps is, uh, as I mentioned before, custom software, essentially. Um, it's a low code or no code development. What that means is that people don't have to be software engineers. They don't have to be coders in order to create a useful customized application. Uh, the screenshot here will actually show you a little bit later. This was built uh, for, at InSource to fill a gap where some of our off the shelf, we mentioned we have HRIS systems, you might have a payroll system. Uh, we have, we had a process that it was okay. Um, it used Google Forms. I'm sure some people might be using that. It had, uh, we would take the summaries and we would post them in our chat channels. We would have emails sent uh, as reminders to the candidates. But it was a lot of effort that was really taking our HR staff, our recruiters, a lot of time and a lot of energy. Um, so we were able to develop a custom app to make a lot of that work, not zero, but very close to it, make a lot of that work much easier and much quicker. And because, especially in, in the case of Power Apps, because it's a Microsoft product, it integrates really well with other Microsoft products. But even if you're not in the Microsoft environment, it can integrate with a lot of other platforms. Um, if it's Slack or Google or whatever the tools are you may be using, there is a lot of integration that's available. And it doesn't, I want to highlight, it's not as high a barrier to entry as you might think of when you think of custom software, that it's very accessible, it's very easy. And as Russell was alluding to, it's getting easier, especially because they're introducing uh, AI tools that help build these custom apps with whatever ideas you might have. I know this is a, <laughs> we always get asked about this at some point. So we figured we'd get ahead of it right now and talk about the licensing. Yes, there are costs associated, but especially for nonprofits, there's some really advantageous pricing. Oh, uh, I think I saw. I saw a question come in, and I will say we just signed up for Airtable. Could these types of, of tools integrate? Yes, I'm going to go ahead and touch upon that um, because Power Apps, I do believe, I'm, I, I don't want to speak out of turn and say absolutely yes. I will say I strongly believe it's very likely. Um, I don't know it for a fact. I will say there are tools that are integration tools that even if it's not a native integration for Power Apps, which I'm, I'm seeing Russell maybe is looking up on the side while I do this. I was just trying to find the question, sorry. Oh, okay. It was a Q and A that popped up. Yep. Um, okay, so I'll touch upon that. I'll talk about pricing and I'll, we'll see if we can answer that by the end of this call. Um, for the pricing, the Power Apps, the first 10 users, I took the screenshot there just because I wanted to make sure I proved it to myself and everyone else. The first 10 users can be free for the, the your first Power App. So it's one app, uh, 10 people can just use it, no additional licensing. The idea being that Microsoft wants to give organizations a chance to experiment, to experience what it's like and figure out if it's a fit for your organization. If you need more than 10 users, that 11th and 12th user and so on, those are $2.50 per user per month. Um, and that's for one Power App. What we see is actually most common is these last two bullets uh, either People will use unlimited Power Apps because it's only $5 a user a month. So if you're using two or more, you're you know better than break even. Or we've seen that a lot of organizations are already using Microsoft 365 E3 or Microsoft 365 E5. I know this is a little bit in the weeds, but uh, more than likely your organization may be using a bundled license. And many of those bundles include Power Apps functionality. So it may not be any additional cost uh, for those first, those first forays into the Power Apps world. Power BI is kind of similar, slightly different. Uh, Power BI Pro is what most people end up needing or using, $3 a user a month. And that's for people where you want to interact, have those interactive reports. You want to share, you want to collaborate. If it's just a single person, and you don't need an interactive version, you just want essentially like a PDF of the report, there are ways to do that that doesn't have any additional cost. Um, Power BI, the actual application is free. It's the collaborative part um, that incurs a charge. 
And very similar to Power Apps, if you have particular license bundles, uh, the one of the top tier ones is Microsoft 365 E5. It actually includes a Power BI Pro license for everyone with that. So all of these licenses are discounted for nonprofits and pretty steeply for nonprofits. So it does make it a, a much more attainable license than it would be for for-profit organizations. So as we take a step back, we like to think about how do automations and systems apply to the employee journey. And when we've done a lot of process work, we think of the employee journey starting with a requisition. I need to hire a candidate for a job. Now I need to post the job, Indeed, LinkedIn, ZipRecruiter, whatever other job sites. Then it comes to interviewing the candidate. Then it comes to offer letter after reviewing resumes and filtering. And once the candidate's accepted, now you're doing onboarding onto your systems and then it's employee management going forward. And at every step of this journey, there are a lot of ways that technology can make it easier for both the HR department and make the employee experience um, more pleasant. With the, I, with the technology, you can post a job really easily with a lot of these systems. You can just put the job description in your system, the requisition, hit post, and it immediately goes to five, 10, 15 or 20 more sites at once with what you're looking for. You don't have to log into Indeed, LinkedIn, ZipRecruiter. With the HRIS systems, you can just hit a button, post job, and it's out there. When candidates <laughs> want to apply for a job, they're taken through a journey via an online platform to apply for it. They don't have to email. When they go to the job posting, they can click, enter their info, and put it in there. When you get all the resumes and everything, and it's easier to look at them all, it's not over email, it's in a dashboard. A lot of these systems are refining it to summarize them for you. They're trying to put AI on it. And when you want to schedule it, you can do a lot of that, again, within the system and get feedback so you can see an aggregate Who's applying? What's the feedback? How am I doing? There's much less administrative overhead in a lot of these systems because the HRIS systems now integrate with your, uh, your benefits. All the paperwork and process is in the system. So an employee logs into a portal and they can self walk through uh, filling out the paperwork on the portal. No more email, no more sending back. The background check, e-verify process is in the portal automated. <coughs> you don't have to submit anything. The systems do that for you. You get the you get the information back in the systems. And it goes on and on for uh, the handbook signing. Can, there can be some onboarding material, training videos, all self-directed from the employee standpoint. HR can just see a dashboard if people are following it. No paper. No sending people Adobe documents, they got to print and sign, no moving files around. And the data goes into the systems from the employee directly for approval. So ideally, it's more accurate. Naming, titles, addresses, address changes, all sorts of information you're trying to gather, now it can be gathered directly. Some examples of it. So this is our ADP Workforce Now job posting page. This is a public page for candidates when they want to apply for jobs. So you can make it look like your company with pictures of your staff, uh, have, have the culture look and feel that you want, and all the sites, the, the Indeeds and the Zip Recruiters and the LinkedIn's will come back to here so the candidate can click on the job and self-paste them through that journey. You, this is a UKG screenshot of a recruiter dashboard. So once people apply and you as uh, trying to field who's applying, this is a dashboard view to let you see candidates that are in your system by level, job titles, how many, how many openings do you have that you need to fill, where people in the process of resume and interviewing and offers accepted. So these tools now give you a dashboard look at where are my candidates going through the process, where are we? 
gives managers and hiring managers and leadership easier access to information that maybe you'd have to pull together through Excel. It's always there. It's always real time. And then once they're in the system, this is a fake employee um, created, uh, you then have information about candidates you can manage in the system or the managers can see. Their titles, their start dates, their, uh, if they start a new position, they get promoted that date, what their pay rates are, and all that can be managed within a system, reduces the email, uh, allows managers to manage some of this data directly, but it gives HR still overview and approval processes um, and reduces time reporting on it manually because it's all in the system accessible to those who need it. And the way we see it all tied together through Power Apps, through HRIS systems, HRIS systems might do 80, 90% of what you need them to do really, really well. But maybe they don't have a stay interview process the way you want it. Or the HRIS system, the 360 questions it offers don't match your culture. Maybe the performance management questions, you don't want to do rating scales. You don't want to do uh, match it up with a competency. You just want to focus on goals. Or the recruiting feedback isn't uh, tailored to how you want to do recruiting feedback. So that's where Power Apps comes into place. So when we think about things, we try to do as much as possible in the core system, the core HRIS system you're using. But the Power Apps are reserved for the important thing that the HRIS system doesn't do well that you want to nail 100%. So you can build a power app to do the performance management or the stay interviews or the recruiting feedback, which we'll demo for you in a second. And all the data from your HRIS system, all the data from your power apps uh, that are built for you can be put into one dashboard using Power BI. So Power BI brings it all together across all your systems. So this example, you'd be able to see how many employees do I have? <coughs> What's the average age? Any data you want is what you can display. So it's not, it doesn't have to be just this data, it's any data in all of your systems can be displayed in one power app. So imagine a world where you say, show me all the employees I hired this year. Show me all the employees I hired this year that got promoted within the year, the rock stars. Now show me the average recruiting feedback on these employees to see if you can start predicting who will be your rock stars based on the initial feedback. That data would be available to you tying it all together. Does anyone here already have a dashboard with this type of information in your systems? Well, we'll give you some next up because we're going to do some demos and you'll be able to see um, what these things look like um, in action. So Scott, I will pass it over to you. Yep, I think you'll have to stop. Great. And hopefully you Business should... intelligence. So yeah, uh, BI stands for uh, business intelligence. All right. And Russ, I'm going to rely on you for any chat or questions for the screen share. Um, I'm hoping you can see now a map. This is for anyone who's uh, maybe worked with Microsoft examples. Van Arsdale is a fictional company. Uh, this is just a sample dashboard confirming you can see it. So imagine um, this is obviously we had to use a sample dashboard for this demo. But if you had an HR recruiting dashboard and you maybe your a large organization with people um, in other countries, you're an NGO. This one, it's interactive. So you could click on a location to see data um, of people in that location. So with power, when we said Power BI was interactive, it's not just a report, it's an interactive report and you can drill down information. So this would be, I wanna see employees in just this location to start. And you can, and maybe instead of categories, that they have here, your categories could be job title. Your categories could be tenure. Your categories could be salary. You can really think about it many different ways for decision-making, 
but all of the data here from your managers would be interactive for them so they don't have to ask maybe HR all these questions once this is built. They can interact with the data to get the answers that they're looking for. You can even change things like timeline and scale. So in the up top, this is where you can adjust in the reporting the, the dates, the years, the months that you want to look at the data within a Power BI report like this. Any questions on the Power BI, like what, what's possible with it? Great. Next up we wanted to share um, was the recruiting app uh, that we had to build and what it does. So uh, the product we were using didn't have the exact questions we wanted them to have. Our questions, we spent a lot of time tailoring them uh, for DEI factors and other biases that we wanted to try. We worked with a consultant to get it down. And the built-in HRS system couldn't do that. So we built our own. What we were doing prior was a Google form that the HR person would have to create for every new candidate, email to all the interviewers, take the data results and then email it back for decision-making. It was a very time-consuming process for the HR department to deal with that. And we wanted to speed it up for them, make it easy. So this Power app allows the HR department just to click add new candidate. They type in their name, their position, and they click add interviewers and they can add whoever's interviewing here so they can I'll let Scott fill in my name. So it auto fills and then he just clicks add candidate. That's it. So what was possibly a, probably an overall half an hour process of going through steps and something could be forgotten. It's less than a minute. And Scott has the candidate now out there for me to fill in feedback with my scheduled interview on the candidate. Russell what, and I both just got emails saying, hey, you've been added as a reviewer. Click here to provide your feedback. Now that we're supposed to provide feedback before the HR department would have to go back into the Google Forms to see if we provided the feedback, which we're supposed to do. But in this tool, uh, you can see that we didn't. So the, all they have to do is the HR department now has a dashboard view to say who hasn't provided feedback, who has um, just by logging in. So again, saving them time, getting the information. Now, once everyone did complete the feedback and we want to go review um, what we're all thinking, this dashboard, and again, only the right people should see the right data. Uh, so everything can be granular at that level. You can click on the candidate and you can see the results um, on, a, on a candidate by person who filled it out or in aggregate. So here's Scott's results. Um, yeah, I'm one step too early. Sorry. Here's Scott's results on the candidate he filled it out for. All the data is there. Um, and that data could be reported in a Power uh, BI report mm -hmm. or in other mechanisms historically. And then here's the average of that candidate that would be here for all the people that filled it out. And it and it and then have the historical data, and it can start allowing us to then look back as time goes by, years go by, have we been doing a good job with our feedback based on who we know our employees to be um, as they progress? Were we doing a good job of finding candidates who valued the work? I'd like to briefly just show this has all been from the recruiter perspective right now. There is as an interviewer. I only see the candidates that I am selected to be an interviewer for. Um, so I already completed feedback here, but I still need to complete feedback for this candidate. Um, but it's nice and simple, very intuitive. And all of these values here were customized to what we wanted them to be. Um, so that meant that we we didn't have to fit into a box that somebody else had defined. We were able to define the choices for all of these fields. Okay. Great. Uh, we don't, um, some other apps we had to create, we don't have a demo system for that yet. We, we had to do a very similar thing for performance management as well. 
make sure I'm back. So there's a lot to this world. It's it's ever changing where these automations, what they can do, and they're becoming far more accessible uh, to small organizations as well as large. And what they can do and interact with is also rapidly changing. We always start with the main HRIS system, ADP, UKG, other systems, and then we tie in the Microsoft tool set to it for better reporting, uh, automations of things the HRS can't do, uh, and then maybe things that we want to do a very different way than what it offers. Any questions from anyone here? And I do, we, I answered in text the previous question about Airtable. Uh, yes, I confirm there is a connector. And I also mentioned in the chat or in the Q&A section, uh, there are a lot of options to maybe take the data and put it elsewhere and then use that. That's often a frequent approach when it comes to reporting, that you will report on data that doesn't impact the system live. Um, but yeah, lots of options. And Airtable does, in fact, play nicely with the technologies we've talked about. And as you're thinking about it, you, I would suggest not uh, thinking big to start. If you're, if you're new to you, find one thing that you wish you didn't have to do anymore and use an automation to solve it, which gets you an idea of what it can do and how it can help you. If you got 10 minutes back a day, that's 10 minutes you can spend on solving another problem to get you back an hour a day, and it can grow from there. Uh, then maybe eventually, you, if you don't have an HRIS system, you could start migrating into that kind of model because that creates more efficiency, but it's gonna take more investment up front to get to it. So a lot of the things we've done, we didn't necessarily do in uh, one project, we kept building on it. So it wasn't too much change for the organization, but looking back, uh, it was it relieved a lot of um, time and improved a lot of experiences. So if there, are no, if there are no questions, we do appreciate everyone's time. We hope this was informative. Um, and we have our contact information here if you have any other questions on this type of material. Yeah, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email to everybody who registered, and then we'll include your contact information on that, as well as the slides. And we'll send that out with the webinar recording as well, once we have the recording all uploaded and everything. So everyone, just keep an eye on your email for that. Cool. But yeah, um, glad you found the webinar informative. And thank you again to Russell and Scott for presenting all that really great information. We're really glad to have you here and we appreciate everything InSource does. Oh, I'm the cat. And yeah, so yeah, have a great day, everyone. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you.